Megan, just so you know, you're you're muted. Yeah, I keep doing that. Sorry. <laughs> it's, you know, it takes a village to get everyone <laughs> on the panel. Um, so for everyone who's starting together, we'll start in about three minutes. So we wait our three minutes out. I'll do, uh, we'll do the, what is the, um, what's the weird thing that you started doing uh, during this time of COVID and sheltering in place uh, that, that you wouldn't normally be doing? So for me, I always do like, what do I do? Uh, one of my big things is uh, the lack of shoes that exist in my life. So I no longer do I attend a meeting or do almost anything with a pair of shoes on. And that includes just like, you know, just, I never put shoes on if I don't have to now. So my, my big thing is naked feet. What about the rest of you? <laughs> Think about that. What's your, what's the thing that you now have taken up that you wouldn't have normally be taking up because of COVID? Uh, I sit outside most, uh, most of the mornings and just walk from my back, from, uh, yeah, the back of the house. I just, I have it patio table and chair there and I use it now more often. It seems like that's my go-to place to find peace. <laughs> I like that. So I'm sitting, I find myself sitting there a lot these days. I like that. But you, Sam, anything? Um. I'm a creature of habit. Uh, looks like I haven't changed much. Uh, <laughs> I go through almost the same routine. Um, try to prepare the very same way I prepared before COVID. So, yeah. Uh, but when I have meetings home, that is, yeah, there's a spot on the couch that I sit in. Uh, it has a painting of me and my wife that a friend ba painted, so, um, and everyone keeps asking me about it. So I guess that's the new thing during this COVID season that I'm getting used to sitting in that spot, the very same spot in my house on a couch uh, for Zoom meetings. So, but right now I'm in my office. We have new people. Hi, hi, Joseph. Hi. And Nicholas. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, good, good. We are running up and down. It's so busy, so, so many things going on. Trying to adapt to the change and accommodate and all these things. So it's it's hard. Well, I am, I am grateful that you are here. Welcome everyone who is joining our town hall. Today we're listening to some of the voices from the, the team uh, program that have come, come to provide creative and diverse and insightful and uh, useful ministry in our Lutheran church. Um, for those who are joining us on our Zoom webinar, you do not have the ability to turn on cameras or to turn on microphones because we're in the webinar format. This format allows us to really focus on the voices that we are listening to today and um, will also decrease the likelihood that people will intentionally disrupt our listening conversation. Uh, for those in the Zoom webinar, there is a chat box, which is a great place to share any insights or resources that you might want to share with the group. If you want to introduce yourself, it's a great place to do so. Um, if you would like to lift up questions for our panelists, uh, do that in the Q&A box. Um, but if you forget, I'll try to scooch them over for you. If you are watching us on Facebook Live, you can put your, your comments and questions directly into the comment section and I'll be sure to get them over. Or you can use the hashtag LutheransListen. 
And after our town hall today, the video of this conversation will be available at justlutheran.com for anyone who is interested in this conversation or conversations we've had in the past. Please know that as people share their opinions in particularly in a town hall setting, one that's recorded and available for people to listen to, that it is a leap of faith that people are doing so, providing mostly their own opinions and not speaking for other cultures beyond themselves. And um, I want to give my profound thanks to those who have gathered with us today uh, and also give permission for anyone who experiences technology hiccups at some point in this town hall to know that that's a part of the Holy Spirit dwelling amongst us these days. And with that, I will turn over today's panel to Pastor Christina. Hey, um, first thing I'd like to do is thank uh, Megan for putting these panels together and uh, the amazing work that they have been doing and how much I've been enjoying watching them um, throughout the last couple months. And then I also want to say thank you to um, Moses Penamaka, Dr. Moses Penamaka, um, for having the opportunity to ask those of us who are here today um, to come in and be panelists and to share about uh, this program called TEEM, T-E-E-M, uh, that is available through uh, PLTS Seminary, Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary, for those who are not sure which seminary that might be, it's the one in Berkeley. So I welcome uh, my all of my fellow, what we call ourselves, teammates. Um, I welcome all of them. Um, we did not necessarily all go to school together at the same time, but we all come out of one spirit. Uh, and so for me, I feel connected always to uh, my fellow teammates as I'm sure most people who've uh, gone to school in some way feel the same way with their, when they're alumni. So I'm gonna pass this over. Um, to start off, I'm gonna let, um, I'm gonna let you guys go ahead and share um, who you are, where you're from and, uh, a little bit about uh, your context that you are in, as well as what some of the intersections that uh, you embody within that context and within your own personal life and how you come together. And so by doing this, I didn't pick someone to go first. So one of you will naturally willfully do that for me, right? <laughs> And it is. Who wants to go first? You guys are cute. So um, I'm gonna just go right and do a little diagonal cut on my screen. Nick, uh, Sam, could you share a little bit about yourself? Thank you, Pastor Christina. Uh, my name is Sam Saber, and uh, I serve here at SeaTac in Washington, uh, Prince of Peace Lutheran Church. Um, I was born and raised in Uganda and moved over to the United States uh, a couple of decades ago. Um, uh, I'm married. I have two, no, three beautiful kids. One son and two daughters <laughs> and uh, it's a joy to be on this panel and to talk about uh, the biases uh, within our uh, circles and uh, you know we live in strange times and um, I think there's a lot of waves that are rattling our, uh, our boats uh, that are causing us to rethink what we are doing and how we are doing it and how we are being effective witnesses to the gospel that we've pledged our lives to. So um, it's a great honor to be here with you all. Sam, you have the honor now to pick the next person to go. <laughs> uh, I think I'll pick Clarissa. <laughs> Well, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Clarissa Days. I am um, serving as the synodically authorized minister at Martin Luther Lutheran Church 
in Mobile, Alabama. It's um, Martin Luther Lutheran Church on Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue. And um, let's see, um, I have two children, two girls, uh, seven and six. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm very interested in um, very excited about having this conversation about um, how to tackle the numerous bias in this country as well as in the ELCA and how we can navigate through that, not just navigate, but have effective and productive communication and to not shy away from stuff that makes us uncomfortable. Um, and I'm, I wasn't really clear on intersections. What is that? The intersection is uh, who you are, and it comes in, um, I'm going to go ahead and read you a definition because this is how I go through all my life. I got to look up a definition. So for everyone who's listening, and maybe you also struggle with the word. So intersectionality is the interconnected nature of our social categorizations such as race, class, gender, as they apply to a given individual or a group. Um, and so one of the things you can think about is um, you would think about your race, you think about your um, also about female, you said you're a mom. So all of those are your intersections and how do they all come together? So if you, you could start to name all the different things and the ways that you meet into who you are today. But mm -hmm. I guess intersections, yeah, you would say motherhood, um, just it feeling like and minority feeling like you have to explain yourself. A lot of the questions that I would get growing up would be, why are you Lutheran? You're black, you're not supposed to be Lutheran. You know, um, we have a, it's a lot of questions in regards to that. Like, um, I guess that would have me to feel like that would be an intersection because now I get to, as I finish seminary school, I have a clearer understanding of what it means to be Lutheran. And now when someone asks me, why am I Lutheran? I can say, why not be a Lutheran? So, um, very interesting. Uh, they all, inter like you said, they're all intersecting and they all make me who I am. Caring as much as I can be, uh, patient, because I have two little children, two girls. And, you know, just, I guess that's it, yeah. Now you get to pick the next person. I'm gonna go with Nahaley. <laughs> Hi, my <clears throat> my name is Nahaley Label. I am currently in um, Atlanta, Georgia. I serve the Epiphany Lutheran Church in Conyers, Georgia. Um, originally from Sierra Leone, West Africa. I'm a mother of two kids, a boy, two who are grown-ups now, a boy and a girl. And um, yeah, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm excited to join here on this panel this afternoon. It's such an honor to have me on to uh, have these discussions. Um, I will say this is a, a, a little familiar because our church had already started um, some of the talks about uh, racism and social justice, we've been having some of those discussions. So I'm more than happy to be on this panel and to join you on to share my experiences and views on uh, bias in the uh, Lutheran Church as well as in the world as a whole. Very nice. Take the next person. Um, well, of course, I think he knows. Um, the next person is going to be Joseph. Good afternoon. I'm Joseph Castaneda Carrera, and I am pastoring two communities in Los Angeles, um, in Hollywood, and it's a lot less glamorous than it sounds. Um, I pastor a traditional Lutheran church that is 99 years old, turning 100 this next year. Um, traditional. Um, white, elderly, wonderful congregation. Um, at the same time, I am developing a uh, new church worshiping community named Adore LA. 
Um, and Adorale is a self-described queer community of faith experiencing God in unconventional ways. Um, we take previously, uh, people who previously participated in church and um, were hurt in an experience um, by uh, toxic people or toxic theology and are now um, Lutherans or gather in a Lutheran community because the theology is so rich in grace and inclusive of all of our experiences. Um, in my mind, I always say to people that um, if your theology doesn't in it doesn't uh, cover up your body and embrace your body, then uh, you need a bigger theology. Um, I am a queer uh, first generation from my mom's side, fourth generation from my father's side, um, Mexican American. I um, have been married in. Um, for six years now with my husband who is amazing and is from Trinidad and Tobago and I love the in-laws and all the culture that they bring um, and uh, just a lot of minority intersections in my identity um, and um, yeah I think it's really important for intersectional leaders that are not approaching it just from one minority perspective because it's so easy to then to isolate yourself and to silo yourself off. But when we're intersectional leaders, we have a good enough view of what's going on and how different marginalized people experience life that we deeply can find compassion and the ability to fill with people that are basically experiencing any kind of marginality. And I will pick Nicholas. Okay, I guess I'm the last one. Okay, um, I'm Nicholas Chove from uh, Tanzania, the land of Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, originally from there, I <laughs> sorry live in Texas, uh, Dallas, Texas. And I serve uh, two different congregations. I do serve one which is uh, African descendant people who speak Swahili. And then we do speak Swahili in our services. And I do serve another congregation that uh, are predominantly African American. We do have few uh, Caucasian people, but again, uh, it's predominantly African American. Uh, that's what I do. And uh, that's all about me. I'm, I'm married with uh, five children. Five children, two boys and three girls. That's all about me. I bet there's more than that about you. And we'll continue because we'll find out more about all of us. Um, so uh, I want to introduce myself. I'm Pastor Christina Boschman. I am a graduate of the team program at PLTS. I graduated and I was ordained in 2015. And um, I think part of what we need to understand is what is the team program and how did this group of people that you see in front of you today end up in a team program. And so I want to give a little bit of background um, from my own, my own intersection of, of how I ended up in a team program. And then I will open this up so that the rest can also share that aspect. So I am a single mom. I am not a cradle Lutheran, which I know by, by most people, right? We look at people and uh, especially in our church, she's blonde hair and blue eyes. So definitely she's a Lutheran, right? And I think that's that mistake that we make over and over again is that we assume a lot of things about who we are and, and, and what we're doing. I heard that from Clarissa about how like, how are you a Lutheran? Like these are these great questions that people ask that you just, you know, you learn to smile and nod. But I'm a single mom and God called me into the Lutheran church. What a crazy thing. I was 
going to an evangelical church. Um, I know nobody likes to talk about that. One of our um, local mega churches. And I found my way into the Lutheran church and I found my way into finding a place that I would call home that met me in a place that I needed to be met and allowed me to see so much more of who God was and in a rich way of experiencing God that I was not getting where I was at. And in the midst of that, God called me and said, you should be a pastor, of which case I said, there's no way as a single parent that I could become a pastor. And so I was serving as an administrator at a, at a Lutheran church. And then I was a ministry leader for children and youth. And, and then we discerned the idea that there was an emerging moment in our church that we needed to be able to reach out into the community in a new way and in a different way. And so we were, I was, I, and uh, I was looking at how do we reach into that? And that's what we call emerging. And churches that are emerging are, are churches that are looking at all the different ways of being church that are not always our standard norm. Um, I heard that from Joseph, and I have a feeling we'll hear a little bit more from everyone on what makes our churches unique to uh, the context that we're in. And so team met me in that place. I didn't have to give up working and I didn't have to move to the seminary and I didn't have to change my whole life in this dramatic fashion. But team offered me the ability to do a program and become a, an ordained pastor through um, a channel that worked uh, into my life. So most team uh, candidates are candidates who are in their second calling in their life. Uh, they've, they've done something different and now they're moving into this other way. And so that was how I ended up in team was as a single mom, there was no way seminary was ever going to work for me. And I really knew that God's call for me was great. And I want you, uh, the rest of the panel to share about how, how team was able to meet you where you were at and how God's call to you brought you into the ability to do what you're doing now as pastors and leaders uh, in the church. So I'm going to call on, because I get to do this, right? Ah, and you're exactly the one to call. So Joseph, I'm going to go ahead and call on you, Joseph. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm never too quiet, and everybody probably knows this already. So I just want to like, reframe that a little bit in my experience and what I know about church today and about our ELCA church and our beloved people is that sometimes we look at team as something that was flexible around the candidate and it brings people who couldn't otherwise do it to the to serve and I think that is very true but what I also think is that it the flexibility actually allows for the church to be enriched to be enriched and to bring people who God needs serving the church that, that wouldn't come otherwise to do it. So I think what really, how I view it is team is not necessarily meeting individual people's needs to serve, but rather it's innovating within a church, recognizing that it needs people with diverse abilities and diverse backgrounds and that that's not present and that that's wrong and how do we fix that? And until we fix that underlying problem of how we are not having diverse people of that can meet diverse needs it will continue to be very very necessary as an alternate route to infuse our godly church with godly diversity and people that have a call and that our church has historically not been able to incorporate and i think just its existence reduces reduces how bias impacts people with their true calling and it allows us to come in. So for me, I was working as an executive director of a nonprofit, and I had been there for 10 years, and I was, um, I had just finished a master's program maybe two or three years prior, and I thought, goodness, I'm called, and I should do this, but I don't want to take out a second loan, because um, seminary is very, very expensive, and for me, this was an alternate route where I could actually get the good combination of praxis and learning at the same time. I really don't believe in the pedagogy of separating yourself out. Um, I don't believe in separating yourself out from the world to learn about how to serve people. I think that's a little bit backwards. Let me learn how to be a pastor and let me not interact with people every day for, you know, for three years and then I will do it. I just think it's a little bit backwards. So I think it's just, 
a great reason for me to have gone into it. I'm all about making sure that people know that this is the gift to the church, not to individual candidates. Because yeah, so I love that, and I I get on my soapbox all the time on on teams. So um, because I I feel like we're working and doing, and we were working and doing and living out the our call throughout the whole process. Yeah. That we don't we don't get ordained and go like, oh my gosh, I have no idea what to do. Like we're we're like we're already running before we even get ordained. So. And, and I think that's where the bias comes in. A lot of people in the larger church will say, well, you know, team students aren't as good as regular seminary pastors because, you know, we had to make exceptions for them because they couldn't do the normal program. And in my mind, that's just, it is a gift. It is a gift. And um, that we should under, we should try to disrupt that belittling of team pastors because honestly like they are some of the best pastors i know and i think that um the, the way to stop that bias is by by saying like no it's not we didn't do it for them we did it for ourselves for our future for god's future in our hands thank you you by the way get to pick the next person um i will i'm gonna go with sam nick sam nick looks like he has something to say <laughs> I thank you, Joseph. Um, yeah, I think I want to bounce off of what Joseph was sharing there. Um, I think the danger we can fall in is, uh, especially when we are talking about bias and unity within our church, to think that unity is uniformity, um, that we have to do everything uniformly and not embrace diversity uh, uh, Tim uh, brought an aspect uh, of church that uh, is not probably uh, celebrated in most uh, the normal seminaries. Um, and um, there is a lot of uh, growth, there is a lot of uh, strengths and um, it's literally going where God is at work. And um, it opened many of us to uh, the truth, the reality of the church we experience on a daily basis. And the different contexts and the different people that I've interacted with, our class was so diverse. And when you're only confined in a different context, you may not have the ability to know and realize that there is God happening all around us and in different ways uh, through different people. Um, and I think that's the beauty of team. Uh, it really enriches the church. It expands the borders uh, of our church to reaching people that we will never have reached with a gospel and with the good news of Christ. And, um, but we would need to really work hard uh, as a church body to embrace that diversity. Uh, and I think there's a, still a lot of us who think that, uh, you know, there are some things that don't belong they're not Lutheran, like Clarissa was saying earlier on. She's being asked, are you Lutheran? What are you, like, you know, uh, is that a, a question? Uh, many times I meet people and ask, you know, because they hear my accent and they ask, am I American? Uh, so some people don't think I am American uh, <laughs> because of that. So I, I think diversity is what God is and you know, you look at this panel, you really see the face of God. Um, you start to embrace who God is, and uh, then you start to embrace the diversity that God brings. Um, so Tim really helped a lot of us to open our eyes to uh, what God is doing around us uh, that many of us were blind to. Uh, we're blind to the ways that God is raising leaders within 
the communities of color. Uh, we were blind uh, by the fact that um, people of color can be Lutherans and effective Lutherans. Um, so it, it is a reality that the team program has helped to open the church too. And for that matter, I think it's not just theological education for emerging ministries. I think uh, this is the emerging church. Uh, the church is really rising from the margins to uh, to be the church in the world and to reflect and you know shine the glory of God in ways that um, we have not seen before. Um, so yeah, uh, that's my little take on team program and how grateful that I was a part of uh, that program. Uh, and it's not just an alternative for seminary education. I think it is for me uh, that the tool that the church has to equip and uh, not just those uh, who are people of color and you know in emerging ministries, but all leaders uh, to be effective in their outreach in the way we take the gospel to the next generation or to the generations to come because a lot of our communities are changing and they're changing fast. And I think as a church, we need to catch up with that. And for the next person, I will, I'll still go with Clarissa. <laughs> um. And I have to agree with um, Pastor Christina in the in the sense that it was more of a conventional um, conventional thing for me. I'm a single mother also um, with a full time uh, vocation, and it became a question of um, you feel the call, you hear God's call, but you don't see it happening in your life. You don't see having the time or having the resources or having the ability to pursue calling in which you are given. And team offered that to me. And still in the beginning, I was unsure as to how it would all play out in my life. Um, but I'm telling you, when God starts working, it's best to just get in that passenger seat and just start riding. So I just, uh, I prayed, I said, God, if it's your will, then it's going to be done. So team allowed that, that ability for me. And not only that, it, it provided a great context change. Uh, my, the context that I serve in is 100% African-American. And to go into a team classroom and to see the diversity that I would normally see in my own context you know, just per further prove the fact that, you know, God is moving in this place. So it just became an um, an ability for me to do what well, to follow that call that I was given. And I agree with Joseph in the sense that, you know, oftentimes we even as our as our own minorities try to limit ourselves to one group or one sect or the next. And it's bigger than that. And when we start to actually realize that, then God is going to show us reality. So team was, yeah, and I agree with the statement that it is a great way to, it's a, not just a help for us, but it's a help for the church itself. Mm -hmm. It allows otherwise silent and ignored persons to be able to be heard. So yeah so that was my my take on team it was at first a conventional reasoning and then now that joseph has has enlightened me <laughs> i realized that 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 it's bigger than that so yeah that's why team for for me and i'm going to go with i'm gonna go with nicholas Well, thank you, Clarissa, and uh, 
I appreciate what you have addressed. When we came in, actually, all of us, we saw uh, diversity. And then, actually, uh, there's something that someone will learn through the team program. Uh, by being there, by interacting, and by even uh, studying. I mean, uh, all together is learning. Actually, it draws uh, a lot of uh, attention to everything that we do there, the way we uh, interact and the way we, we, we do things. Uh, and, and, and Tim, for me, uh, pretty much I would say that I've been in different schools uh, for theology. <laughs> it's more practical. It's more practical. And uh, people who are coming uh, in practical, understanding one another, that's the most important thing, people to be able to understand one another and be able to interact with one another uh, understanding that you are united in one cause. And uh, there's a major reason that is bringing everyone together, which is love of God. So that's, that's so important for, uh, for all of us when we get there. Now, when you come to uh, understand some time, they're a little bit different between the, uh, the uh, traditional uh, Lutheran uh, theological education, which you can call seminary, and the team. Team is more practical, like I said. Uh, people who are coming from the working area and uh, people who are uh, directing the seminary from school, they are actually getting deeper there and spending more time there. But I think they are all, we are all in one one course. We are all in, I mean, in one accord. We are all uh, getting one thing to reach to God's people. It's not a different. When we come to, uh, to, 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 to work together, I mean, we are all people who are working for, for, for one master, for, for God. So, I think I think we are all one, and I wish if they were to be like a bridge that will make this. I've seen in seminary sometimes uh, people are uh, are brought together, say, oh, so we can meet the uh, residents and and people who are team here who are coming for short time, but I think it should be more than that. I think it should be more than that to make sure that uh, people understanding the reason for for doing what we're doing so which is uh because for to proclaim the love of uh, jesus christ that's what i think is uh is is the main point when i see there and again like i said others have mentioned a lot but uh, like i said tim is a very unique program that uh, that uh, take people from work and polish them and set them in the work to continue to do work in a better uh, manner, in a better understanding, which is very, very important. I think it's, it's really unique. It's very, really unique to me. So who would you like to call in next? Mia Hill. You're still muted. <laughs> thank you, Nicholas. Sorry, <laughs> I have to learn to do that. Um, thank you, Nicholas. For me, my journey to uh, team um, is a little bit of everybody's story as well. Um, I didn't even know about the Lutheran Church. <laughs> I am not a cradle Lutheran. I grew up in the United Brethren in Christ, and. Um, so coming to Atlanta, I looked for the United Brethren in Christ and there was none. And um, I had just uh, come from a bitter divorce, a single mother with two kids, and I just wanted to get into a church. And so I found a Lutheran church. I read about it. 
And so I started joining the church and uh, I joined the church. It was a Caribbean. It was, um, the congregation was almost 70% uh, Caribbean. And I fell in love with it. And I became very active in the church. And um, I didn't pursue, uh, and I think somebody went and mentioned my name. I, they had actually mentioned it to me. Somebody, a couple of pastors had met me who came to the church while I was there. And they will say to me, um, have you ever thought about going to seminary? And I was like, mm -mm, no, not me, <laughs> you know? So it went to the Senate office. I think somebody mentioned my name there. So I was called and uh, I was uh, somebody, uh, Everett, Dr. Everett Fren Clinigan called me and talked to me about the team program. And I was like, I sat there listening to him, but I was like, I don't think so. Because I had just, like Joseph, I had just done, completed my master's degree. As, as a single mother, I didn't have the funds. I was, I'm like, I'm just out of school. And to go back and take another loan to go to seminary, that's not me. A single mother with two kids, besides, I don't think this is for me. I don't have the time. I'm not going to be able to do it. Besides, why would God call me of all people? <laughs> you know, why? <laughs> I'm, I'm okay doing what I'm doing for the church. When I can come in, I help, I do whatever it is, assist, assistant minister, whatever I have to do for the week, for the day, I do for the church. And I was happy being engaged and having my kids engaged in the church. And, uh, you know, because that's how I grew up. I was so excited about that. And I just didn't see how I could afford it. Not only the money, not only the finances, but the time as a single mother and when your kids are in different activity spots and you're thinking, I'm not gonna have the time for this. And then on top of that, I heard that I have to travel also. I'm like, mm, no, it's not gonna happen. But I, I, I tell the story because I tell everybody when God calls you, he actually calls you. He, God is the one that calls you because with everything I did, kicking and screaming, not to be part of, the, not to be part of this or not to go to seminary, God found a way and he made it possible for me. I remember my first flight to uh, the PLT as I was sitting on the plane and saying to myself, really, am I really doing this? What, what, what am I doing? Am I sure that this is what I went? But when I went to PLTS and my first classes, like I, somebody else said it here and I saw the diversity and I saw the love and I said, this is what church is. And this is what church should be all over. I don't care. This is what church should look like. Church is not one color. Church is all colors, all, 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 all nationalities. It is all people, you know? We, men, women, whatever you are, gay or straight, church should be everything. It should be for everybody. And I said, and I found that joy. And every time I had to go for team classes, I was so happy. That, those were my happiest time to see my teammates, to, just to, you know, to even see the, my classmates, everybody else. It was the best one week of my three years in team program. Those times were the best. And um, I've heard a lot of things and now I am serving. You know, it's funny because now I, am, I came from a predominantly uh, black church and now I'm serving in a predominantly white church. And sometimes one of the questions that, are, one of the things that I say, especially when I was doing my uh, interview, my, the last interview we do after uh, a candidacy, for the candidacy program, it's not the, uh, the approval. And I heard some people who say, oh, she's a team, student, it's going to be impossible to get her into a church or something because, you know, team students. But no, I think team students are bringing, like Joseph said, are bringing so much, um, or Sam said, they are bringing a difference to the uh, Lutheran church. And I think they are making, they are, and this is the difference we need to embrace as our communities are changing, we can't just do the same thing over and over. 
and hope that things are going to, and we, uh, the thing that we're going to grow. We can't, if we see that we are doing the same things over and over and not growing, let us bring something that brings uh, um, joy to the church, that uh, brings people to want to come to the church. And I think team, uh, team students, based on what they were doing on that campus for one week, we had a lot of fun. We changed our services. We, it was fun going to those morning and evening services because we, we in, uh, incorporated a lot of uh, uh, ways of worshiping God. We listened to people from different languages, uh, sing in Chinese, in other languages, you know, even uh, read the gospel in other languages, and it brought so much fun to everybody. And I think that's what a, a um, church should be. And if we're now in communities, like most of our churches are building, built in communities where the communities are changing. They are changing. And so we should be able to bring those people in the communities to come together, to, be, uh, to welcome them in the churches with whatever they have. I come from Africa, maybe I like the drums. Maybe I like to hear the drums play during the service, you know? So team program really exposed me to that. And now I am um, an associate pastor for multicultural ministries in a predominantly white church. And I'm really enjoying my role and bringing all that uh, I learned from the team program. And I think this difference between, oh, we went to seminary school, we have the degree, and those are just going to team, and that I don't think that's it. God calls each and every one of us. And there is a gift in everybody. And that's the purpose of team. And that's what, that's the beauty team brings about. That's the joy team brings about, the team program brings about. And um, um, I'm just happy to be a part of team and, um, just want to tell everybody else that uh, TEAM is a great program and uh, I think it helps the church. Like uh, Joseph said, it not only helps us, yes, it did help me grow in some ways. I love it, it in every way, and especially being a pastor and uh, my growth, but also it also is a blessing to the church. It is a big blessing to the church. Amen. Amen. I um, just keep writing down some of the most brilliant things that each of you are saying. And I have all these notes over here because there's some brilliant, brilliant. I'm going to have to rewatch this. Um, but there's a couple questions that have come up and I want to um, kind of bring them in. And so one of the questions that's come up is um, they want people want to know, um, how are you experiencing in your context and in where you are? How are you experiencing the bias? Where, where does it strike the most? And how are you in your context working with your own congregations and into the larger community uh, when it comes to the, the bias that's happening uh, in all of our lives, but especially um, around, um, around uh, rates? I mean, there's, there are very specific issues. And so I'd like, they'd like to hear, I'd like to hear from you what's happening and how do you feel? What do you, people, what, what do you want people to hear? And I, I'm not even picking today. Uh, I'm gonna let one of you guys jump into that conversation. Look at you then. No one wants to answer that question. Nicholas, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call on you. How, where is, where do you see bias in your context and how are you working with that? Uh. Maybe I would say maybe because I don't pay much attention to that area. Because to me, really, I know people might be looking in a different way and uh, a challenge might be there. But I really want to just to focus on what I focus. Because even in, when we're thinking about uh, this like Lutheran and uh, uh, Episcopal and uh, for me, uh, I really get challenged because I don't know which one is in heaven. Is Lutheran or Episcopal or Methodist? I think we are all Christian to get there. We're all, so I really don't, when people are looking in a different way, I don't really mind, I don't care. 
whoever is doing the board. What I do is just doing the work that I have to do. So whatever I see, I've seen somebody, of course, one time say, you know, I don't like black person. It's fine for me. They don't like, but I, I preach, I preach to the same person. I told, you know what, God created a human being and said it was very good. So everybody is good. So everybody I see is a good person, is a good creation, is a good. So, I mean, whether I have this kind of technology knowledge or I, I don't have this, but I'm called. The most important thing is a call, which God has seen the gift in somebody. There's a gift in each and everyone. That's why people went to nourish and polish those gifts that we have. And for that reason, really, whatever we experience, what I can say, I, I don't really notice much. I don't focus on those, uh, whatever challenges and bias and all things. I just focus on the word of God. I focus on the love of God. I focus on what really I have to do. I don't really notice and try. Whatever they are doing, they are hitting the, the wind. I'm not into that. All right. All right. Okay, I'll take some, some Nick. Yeah, um, I come from the Northwest Washington Synod and um, our Synod leadership, our Bishop, uh, you know, I think they were a step ahead um, when issues of bias, especially the recent um, situations that happened uh, the killing uh, of George Floyd, but even before that, um, our synod has always been, you know, at the forefront. They have stood with, you know, with people on the margins. Um, I've seen a bishop, um, you know, the past bishop and the current bishop uh, marching with people who are marginalized and standing with those who are going through uh, pain and uh, being un, you know, unfairly treated. So I think to me, uh, that kind of leadership is key, uh, especially when we are talking about church, that from top down, uh, we're going to say, we're not going to tolerate any bias. We are not going to tolerate any bigotry, any, you know, not under our watch, not, you know, where we are. Uh, we are going to listen. We are going to uh, be humble to listen and say sorry when we've been wrong. And I've seen all that from our leadership here in the Northwest Washington Synod. Um, but I should say that, you know, closer to the communities where all our churches uh you know, established, we are seeing a change. Um, for example, where our church is, um, it used to be predominantly a white community, working class, middle income class. And, uh, but right now, uh, according to the recent census, uh, almost 40% of all the families living around our church are foreign born. They were born in a foreign country. So there's a lot of change happening within our communities. And uh, as the body of Christ, as the church, we have to be equipped uh, to deal with that undercurrent, to see how we can uh, be the hands and the feet of Christ and to take the love of God and the gospel to our neighbors uh, in ways that uh, we have not done before as a church. Um, many of our communities don't speak English. English is their second language, and some of them have hardship, you know, uh, really learning uh, the culture, the new norms of where they are settling. So it invites us as a church uh, to, op to be open and to... Uh, take off some of the lenses that we looked through to spread the gospel in the past uh, to new ways of how we can see Christ at work and God at work with the communities that are emerging around our parishes. 
So, and there's specific things that we've been involved in, particularly for me here, um, you know, uh, I never was before until I started going into the community and know that there was such a thing as source of income discrimination, um, that landlords um, discriminate renters based on their source of income. Uh, if you uh, get government vouchers, you're not going to be, you know, considered first, you know. So those kinds of things uh, become apparent, especially when we, the pastors, the leaders in our communities, uh, the religious leaders, start to listen to walk with and to be present uh, with those in our communities. And I believe that that's the only way we as a church are going to be uh, vocal, valid, and visible wherever we are, um, to walk alongside those in our communities that are being marginalized and oppressed and uh, singled out and left out and left behind because of who they are, of what they do. And um, so it's a reality, uh, especially right now um, with all the uh, COVID-19 that has helped us to retreat and sit back in our homes, in our living rooms, watch the news a little more, uh, pay attention to the things that we haven't paid attention to in the, in the past. And we are starting to see a lot of people start to change. There are movements, uh, young people, youth that are engaged and so engaged uh, to root out all these biases and all these inequalities that we see on a daily basis. Thank you, Thank you for sharing that. Um, I continue um, with that same, that same question, which is, um, where where do you see the, the bias in your own communities, whether it's in your congregation around, I know, Sam, you really shared a lot about what's going on in your own in the community around your church. So what's happening that you find and and what are some ways that you're you're confronting or or maybe the other word is combating and that's it seems like a, a bad word sometimes, but how are you confronting and how are you combating uh, the biases that you see uh, daily, weekly, and, and that struggle. And I'm going to just go ahead and I'm going to go to Joseph because uh, I know that his, his neighborhoods that he's shared already, I, I am very familiar with. Um, so I know that it's an, an interesting thing that happens. Would you be willing to share a little bit about what's going on in your neighborhoods and your community? Sure. So it's so interesting. Uh, I think especially around racial bias and it's so I think that there's a lot of socioeconomic bias, a lot of racial bias, a lot of color bias, a lot of mental health bias. Um, but what I think also occurs often in the Lutheran church is that we have a bias around forms of knowing, um, especially like forms of knowing God, um, where we value like higher education over somebody's experience who didn't, who experiences God deeply every day and somehow um, somebody with higher degrees not only has studied and knows differently, but knows better. Um, so I think uh, I approach it by trying to know, try to see, I'm not sure if ever anybody has seen the movie The Matrix, but it's where you're walking through life and all of a sudden you see that you are in this, you're like in this machine basically, and you see all the moving parts and you see how it's working. And for me, the gift of knowing bias is it's really being able to see all of it so that you can then enter and function. A good mentor of mine says, you have to love your people but have no illusions about who they are. And I think sometimes for me, the way I can love my people is by seeing bias, how it works everywhere with everyone and then love them and know that we're all stuck in this process together and we're all trying to liberate ourselves from this bias. So we are um, majority people of color in our 30s and in our, um, and uh, all queer identifying. And something that we do since a lot of people have experienced church um, 
trauma and walking into a church building makes their body feel um, unsafe or it makes it feel the violence kind of returns. We've done things such as hike church or dinner church or we've done things that are very much rooted in sacrament and sharing word and fellowship but look very different to us and I think the easiest bias that we get is because we have very specific needs people will say that's wonderful but when are you going to do real church right when are you going to do real church and when will you have an organ and when will you do this and I think I so love my church and I love the people, but I think we're all we're all stuck within this notion of what being Lutheran means and what being Christian means. And there's a bias that if it doesn't look like it has for the last 501 years, that it must not be very Lutheran. And so I experienced in the communities, you know, and I say this with so much love in my heart because I see it, us all stuck including myself in these prejudices that just kind of, we all have lived one experience and it's hard to liberate ourselves from that one experience until we start meeting different people. And for me, I'm very aware that churches that gather people of color, black, indigenous, um, Latinx, Asian descent, oftentimes are the most, um, or at least I'll say it, the least accepting of LGBTQ plus people. Culturally, it doesn't make sense in a lot of these cultures that we come from to be accepting in that direction. So, and in the, in the same way, our LGBT communities, at times when we say, yes, we're going to adore LA and we're going to church, our friends don't understand. And they're like, why would you go to something that hates who you are? And we're all working with such partial truths of what Christianity can be. Um, and then I think, I think all the systems that are out in the world that we experience, unfortunately, exist within our church as well. And we're all trying to liberate ourselves from this, these notions of what it's supposed to be. And there's this such a rooted notion of the way it should be. And I try to tell people, stop shooting on yourself. Like, we don't need all these shoulds. We have to experience God. We have a theology. Something that I experience a lot in the people in my congregation or in Adore LA often experiences, and maybe some of my colleagues here, and I'm really interested to see, Christina, if you experience this as a team person as well, but where people will question if you're Lutheran enough. Like, are you Lutheran enough? And I ask what you think, Christina, because I believe that it's code for doubt that a person of color, a BIPOC person, could be Lutheran. And that the underlying prejudice is that if you look like any of us on the screen, except for you, Christina, that we should, we should question, like, are they Lutheran enough? Because typically our church hasn't accepted bodies like ours in a real authentic, intentional way. I'm so tired of churches that have Times that say all are welcome because it always means different things for each church and it never quite means everybody and even if you we are welcoming sometimes we just don't have anybody so there's a lot of RIC churches which is reconciling Christ to LGBTQ plus affirming and they're affirming yet they don't have any a single LGBTQ plus person and in my heart I think if you're accepting and you're developing behaviors, why would you still not have anybody from that that population in your community? I think it's something our whole church is struggling with. And I think we're walking through it together. And um, and I think we have to be congruent on all the levels. Because if I, as an ordained pastor within the ELCA church, can walk into a church and somebody says, oh no, you're in the wrong building, your church is across the street, as a pastor, I know that I'm in the right place. I know each of us are in the right place because we're bringing diversity to people who may not see it or understand how it fits in. I think the ELCA is lovely and it's built church for so long with, with one type of tool, you know, and a hammer worked for so long. 
but now they're realizing we need more tools. We need more tools. We need different tools. We need a saw. We need nails. We need screws. And, and it's hard to convince the communities because they've never had to have a saw before or a screw before or a, whatever tool you want to be, a level, a tape measure, right? And I think that, that we're in the process and we're working with a lot of congregations that have never been quite diverse. And what our job and team is doing, it's quite godly because it's leaning into a reality that's not here yet, but it's about creating pastors that we need to call to churches who the call committees often don't understand why we need them. And it's a miscongruent, but we are in this moment. We are in this moment of learning and figuring it out. And I am so excited to be alongside all of my peers and colleagues here in this journey. I think Joseph to stem on that was something that Nick had said. Um, and he said that we are all in and participating in the emerging church. Mm -hmm. The church is an emerging church and it needs to be this place that is constantly changing and being made new. We claim this as Lutherans, always being made new. And yet you walk into a lot of our churches and there's nothing new about it and that we've clung to this 500 year old tradition and, and i'm hearing that and um what nick uh i'm sorry what sam said was we need to catch up it's what you said and I, I thought that was i mean i'm taking notes right we need to catch up and so um joseph they, you're so impassioned about the idea of who who we could be as lutherans and who we can be as christians and so one of the things that I, I say about my faith life was people say, so what are you? And I said, well, I'm a Christian currently practicing my faith as a Lutheran. Because I want people to understand that there's a first part of, of where my belief system comes out of. And you, and you asked if people ever wonder if I could be a real Lutheran. And uh, from a different angle completely is I do church very differently. And... Um, I, I, we, at our church, we stripped the model away and we took out so much of what someone might refer to as being Lutheran. And so I now I'm referred to as, oh, you're that pastor who does that other church. You're that pastor. Or another time someone said, oh, we're going to go do low church. And I'm like, what? Did you just call my church low church? And it was that moment where you're, it, you sound less than. I felt less than. Um, because I don't, I don't wear the robes and we don't have fancy things and we don't, you know, chant and we don't, when, whatever somebody must consider that you need to be doing to be Lutheran, we don't do a lot of those things. And it's that moment where you're like, you're calling me out and I'll say, and I'm guilty. I say all the time, I'm like, well, I guess I'm not very Lutheran, but the truth is I'm about as Lutheran as they come because I read through and understand what my faith tells me to be true. And I hear that from you too. So that, I hear that betwixt and that bemoaning of yes, is what separates us from being who we are as pastors and as uh, followers and how we're doing that in our Lutheran tradition. So um, it it's three o'clock and I was told at three, we sort of move into a time of Q and A. I've, I've actually answered a couple of questions that, you know, brought them to the table, but I will, continue. We have lots more we can talk about, but I am watching to see if there's any more questions specifically for this group. Otherwise, I'll just keep asking stuff. Could I ask just what could I add just one brief comment to what you just said? Yeah. So I think it's so interesting. I think for me, when I constantly come up with something that feels bad to me, I try to reframe it. And the, what I've been trying to do most recently is when somebody asks me if I'm Lutheran enough, how I take it is I try to remove it from this context of referring back 501 years so that I, so it doesn't remove me and it doesn't point out differences as much. And I reframe it to when they ask me, are you Lutheran enough? I, in my head, I hear, are you Lutheran enough to bring God and Lutheran theology to people 10 years from now, right? What we all need in the future. And I think when we ask about what Lutherans will need to be in the future, to bring this grace and this theology that's so life transforming, it's a different question because we're not trying to ask people to be the same, we're asking people to be drastically different. That's, 
I'm going to mute myself now. <laughs> so, um, one of the things that um, we've really been called into is understanding bias and what bias looks like. Um, I think that was one of the, uh, a more interesting conversation, just that um, with Joseph is how we, how we see bias, even just as pastors um, and the uniqueness of being a pastor and not being, not looking like this, right? Looking like me, that um, white, Scandinavian-ish looking person. That's what we think of as a pastor. I don't even fit the mold either, because by the way, I am female and I see myself as female and that's, you know, I'm a, I, she, her, hers. And so I am not male in any way. And when we think about pastors, the first thing is male. And I'm sure uh, as I look at all of you on this panel and I think how many of you have also uh, have experienced that, like, well, what does that make? How does that make you a, how do you be a pastor? You're a woman. Um, so these biases that come into question all the time within our, our conversations and into our work as pastors. So I'm going to just put it right back into um, hearing from each of you to, to share when you, when does that bias show up in your church and with your congregation and what are you doing to open and liberate the minds of your congregation on what, what does it look like to be all encompassing and how do you how do you point out the bias and say you know that comment and how do you work through that so i want to open that up to you guys to talk about um i'm also going to do a moment anon hi <laughs> you were kind of late to the party i want you to feel like you can participate so um if you would like to jump into this conversation this anon why don't you introduce yourself real quick just because we haven't had a chance to meet you yet um and who you are and where you serve. Yeah, I think most of the people, uh, I think good evening or good afternoon, I think. I'm sorry, I was a little bit late. This is Anand Darla from California, Fremont, and Good Shepherd, Good Shepherds, I think South Asian Good Shepherd Ministry uh, called GSAM, uh, Fremont. I, yeah, I think our team, Clarissa and um, you know, Pastor, um, Nick and Pastor Nicholas and even Evangeline knows me pretty much. I think uh, we all know each other. So it was uh, really, I think, you know, I'm learning all the things and, you know, taking the points like where and uh, even though I missed and I'm able to grab like, what is the kind of a context for this meeting, my understanding is. I think uh, I truly kind of a, you know, still want to listen more than talking. All right. Well, keep, 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 uh, keep up. And if you find a chance that you want to throw in uh, what you've experienced a lot where you're at too. So, so where, where have you, and I'm going to call on um, Clarissa, where have you experienced in your congregation and, and, it's the bias of whatever's going on in your community, in your context. Bias is an interesting thing because it's different everywhere, right? Um, so how, are you, how do you experience that? And what are you doing to work with that within your own congregation where you serve? Well, specifically speaking, I have not um, experienced any outward um, bias in regards to in my context or in my community. Um, but there's a feeling of, of that, of bias, especially when I look out into this ELCA community and I don't see but a handful or more of Black female pastors. So, um, but I think the best way for us to, for me to handle that situation would be to, like I said, about open and productive conversation that we meet in middle ground with not um, a conversation to be had about who's at fault, but a point of, I hear you, let's talk about it. And I think that's a lot of times where we get um, conversation confused as to, we come into an area um, with the mindset of, let's find out who's, the, who's at fault and who needs to change and who needs to fix it. And it becomes less about fixing the actual problem. I mean, more about just 
more about assigning blame than fixing the actual problem. But, you know, that's a, one of the, the good things about the LCA is that we're willing to stand in the midst of that. We're willing to have the conversation and to um, not only recognize where we have gone astray as um, a community, but to offer up ways that we can make a good and deliberate change. Um, so to handle that situation is to just tackle it and stand in it, stand in it and stand up in any ways that we can. And to recognize that when there is a disparity or it, there is a bias that we stand up and we say something. And that even though we see a little bit of change that yeah, we've come a long ways from where we used to be, but we still have a long ways to go. So recognizing that change is constant and not, okay, well, we've got this, we've done this so far, so let's stop right here. You know, this is good enough, but it becomes, okay, well, we've got this far, so let's push a little bit more. Let's see what more we can do. And um, because this is a very present problem, um, especially with all of the things going on in this world today and people not having an outlet to truly express their frustration and people telling them to remain silent and people telling them that their feelings don't matter and that they're not important. And, you know, you know, just because you wear that collar, that doesn't mean that you're anybody special. So, you know, to say we have, we have, we have experienced change. Yes, we've ordained female pastors, you know, yes, we have made these changes, but we have so, so much further to go. And standing in the midst of that is how we're going to make that change that we so desperately need. To make so that's that's how I'm I'm experiencing this challenge of bias. All right, Nayali, what have you? Thank you. Um, for me, um. I haven't really, I, I've noticed the bias, but I haven't really upright been uh, confronted with a bias, but I know it is there. Um, and I, I've experienced it mostly outside of the church than more in the church, and um, I'll say that. But I will tell you that as a uh, black woman from Africa with an accent, um, there are a lot of times when uh, we are just passed over or looked over as, you know, um, what can she do for us, you know. Um, my first experience when I, I was doing my, the church in which I am right now, as I said, is a predominantly white church. And um, that's the church I did my internship at. And I remember at my, the pastor there actually wanted me and they have never heard it black uh, female pastor, neither one from with a, from uh, Af with an African background or with an accent. I don't think they had ever had one. So <laughs> that was kind of, that was um, a shocking for them. And when I came on uh, to do my internship, I could tell that there was a lot of fear, that there was a lot of resentment. They tried to play nice, but I could see. I remember the first, my first Sunday that I had to preach. I remember somebody actually came in and then finding out that I had to preach actually left. Um, to just go back and later ask people how the sermon went. Um, but it was good because uh, she, they later found out that the sermon went well and today, uh, uh, I mean, it's one of the best exper experiments I ever had during my internship there. But as nervous as probably they were, I was also very nervous. And I'll say that I was also very nervous because this is the first time I had to be in a, as a woman in a predominantly white church. And I was extremely uh, nervous. And I, in my sermon, I did express that. I let them know that. But this is, I use this actually in my sermon. I said, in order to expand your comfort zone, you must be willing to be uncomfortable. In order to expand your comfort zone, you must be willing to expand uh, 
be, be willing to um, be uncomfortable. And that's what I took from that because prior to going there, I was so nervous. I said, what am I gonna do in that church? I have an accent, they're predominantly white and they're older con congregation. I'm not sure what's gonna happen, but I used this in my sermon and I told them, and I told them that we are all walking this journey together. As uncomfortable you guys may be, I am as well uncomfortable, but we can walk this journey together. So I think that's a, that's, those are some of the ways in which we can bridge the gap in showing that because sometimes um, they might not be doing it out of malice or whatever, but just as we are human beings ourselves and we all get uncomfortable. And sometimes you have to let them know that we are sharing this together. We are sharing, we are in this together. And that's how I, I, I handled it. That's how I handled it, that you're not doing, the, you're not alone. I'm uncomfortable myself because I've never been put in this situation. And, but give me a chance, let's work together and let's be uncomfortable together. Because if we want to grow, we can't just be in this little bubble that we have always been. We need to be willing to be uncomfortable. We need to be willing to open up to understand other people, other cultures. How are we gonna learn about other cultures if we're just gonna sit in our little bubble and say, okay, we're okay like this. You never know what's on the other side. So for me, in ways to tackle this, we should be open. We should be open in coming, uh, coming together. And one thing, that I, another thing I also try to tell, express is, even in the Lutheran church, don't just bring a black person in just because you want to say, oh, we have black people here or people of color, not just black, but people of color. Don't just bring it in because it seems like I'm bringing them in also the world we see that we are, into, we, we, we are diverse. We encourage people of color, then you bring them in, but what else? It seems like we're not important. Then what else is there for them? Just to show that you bring somebody in? There are a lot of talents that can be tapped into and that are just sitting there because you just want to bring them to show the world that they are part of you, but yet they're part of you, but they're really not part of you. They're somewhere else. They're in another category. So coming into the uh, Lutheran church, I think we also need to, uh, people of color must also be placed in different paths and we can do in different things wherever they want to do, encourage people of color or whatever, or, or other uh, various uh, um, groups of people, just let them know that we are part of this. When we call you into our church, we are one. We are the body of Christ and the body of Christ is one. Green, yellow, blue, female, male, whatever you are, your sexual orientation, your social economic status, we are one. We are the body of Christ. And that is the beauty of the church. And so it should be embraced in all aspects. Amen. Um, I have, I'm, I took so many notes and I'm still, I need a minute because that, that just, you really, it, it hit me to remind us, um, you said, what are, we, what are we doing when we want to bring someone in? If we, we just want to bring in somebody of color into our church, but what does it really mean? And I, I was struck by that idea that, um, are we just looking at numbers? Um, we look at numbers a lot in the Lutheran church, right? We're always taking a roll call and sending numbers into the greater church body and there's mm -hmm. some uh, lesser lesser churches if your numbers aren't big, right? And so what are we doing then as a church? Who is it? Because it's not about numbers. And you really touched on that idea that this is a gathering place. We're supposed to be coming together in Christ and we're supposed to be growing as people. And everyone brings to the table so much unique, unique abilities. Um, and so from so many diverse different places. And how do we use that in our churches? that expands us and grows us and not shrinks us. And so just, I really had a moment. I just really felt from, from everything you had said. Um, I'm gonna put Sam on the spot because he's over there nodding and I see him over there nodding. So I feel like Sam's got something going on over there too. So Sam, can I just, no, no, just whatever's going on. 
Yeah, you know, personally, before I attended church in China, um, church was routine. And, you know, God had to take me to China in one of the underground churches. They didn't speak any English word. There was one pe person who was trying to interpret and translate for us as quiet as quiet could be. But that experience was so rich. And I, I usually draw back, there's an African writer who said things fall apart when the center can no longer hold. I think as a church, if we go away from our central message and start to major in the minors and minor in the majors, uh, we start to amplify, you know, go after things that uh, become, I think it's an American saying, rabbit trail. And at the end of it, um, we have gone and been sucked so much into it and get all our energy sucked into it. And we have lost uh, track of what we are as a church, what we are supposed to be and what we are supposed to be doing. And usually that's, that helps me. That's my compass. How can we so, I mean, how can we go so far from the message of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love that brought him to us, how God so loved the world. Uh, you know, I'm wondering how, what did God love about our universe, our world that he had to give his only begotten son. And that message of love, that gospel that's so simple, um, we can put it aside and go after our egos, go after selfishness, and we are so self-centered as human beings. I mean, um, like the prophet says, the heart of a human is so evil, who can really understand it? And I think that's where our urges are. When we are starting to be drawn into our preferences, our prejudices, our bias, and be drawn away from the love of God, uh, to see all of these things but we are in our friends in our context our communities are changing so fast and we do not know how to deal with the different people uh, one because uh, I think it was a very different part so we have to take the endeavor are we having some problems? My hearing, did, we, did everyone hear? Could everyone hear Sam? No. S Sam. I'm oh my, uh, is my microphone about, off? No, it was, we had some internet, it sounded like some internet issues and you you had some really good, you, we were all hooked. And then so um, maybe about a minute ago, I know I'm so sorry and I just, but you, but I don't, we don't want to miss everything. So, so just, if you want to just paraphrase the last like minute or so, you're like, can you even get back to that? I'm sorry. Oh, a minute. Uh, like staring yeah. at you like, wait, we can't hear him. <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, to me, it is key that we, as the body of Christ, as the church, we draw back to our central message of love. I think It's, it's, doing it again. it's doing it again. <laughs> oh, Sam, you have to type it all up now in the chat box, okay? Just type, just start typing. Um, <laughs> we I told you the Holy Spirit was going to interrupt at least once. Thank you for proving the Holy Spirit is here, Sam. Oh, the Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to put on my speaker, uh, my headphones, maybe. That uh, it will be it. Maybe, or maybe it's just the internet. I mean, we know internet is only as good as the internet is. Um, okay, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. It's I'm okay. so sorry about that. Where was I? What? What's the last word? But I, I don't know for sure where you lost me, where I lost you. It was but about was, Jesus. Yeah, I think to me, we, 
we go back to our roots, um, you know, we will be a welcoming church. And only God can take the bias out of us. I mean, the much we've been given, how much we've been loved. Um, and I was telling you, you know, when we major in the minors and minor in the majors, uh, to me, it becomes a testament to where, who is leading us. And uh, personally, in my congregation, it's all white. My family is the only black people there. I've never felt out of place in any way. In my synod, uh, through my candidacy, I did not think that they were looking at me as a black person, but they were looking at my abilities and my uh, uh, capacity to serve the church and to serve this body and the kingdom of God. And I think uh, many times uh, we start to draw away from that to, okay, who is around me and how do they look? Do they speak or have an accent like me or not an accent like me? And we start to look for those things and subconsciously, and many times I've found myself in those places, but I always keep reminding myself Hey, I, I'm a child of God. I'm an image bearer. So is my neighbor, regardless of how they look. And that's how I was looked at when we attended a church in China. They did not look at us as people from America. They, we are there to worship. And that bond of love bound us so close to each other that we are hugging each other. And this in, translator was whispering not wanting to disrupt the service, but making sure that we are engaged with what is going on and the life giving the redemptive power of the gospel uh, that made me feel so comfortable and so safe and so at home, even though I was in the middle of the mainland China, uh, away from how I worship daily. So I think to me, uh, the focus and not to discount the bias going on, not to discount all the wrongs that are happening. But I think as we start to focus on the life giving uh, uh, things around us where God is present and at work, it gives us all a platform to come together to start to work to dissolve those differences that we have and to start to learn you know, from each other. And we need to be open also to that uh, vulnerability. We don't know everything. There's no one who is an expert of how a black person like me can behave white. Or, you know, I don't have all the cultures. I don't have all the experiences you've gone through. Uh, you don't have all the experiences I've gone through. Uh, but how can those experiences enrich all of us to worship our God, to come to the same table, to share in the same communion. And I believe, you know, to me, if we start to look for those life-giving ventures or avenues, rather than look for where we are different, where we are, you know, uh, diverse and try to amplify those and Oh, look at how they worship. They lift their hands up. They clap their hands. They play drums or they don't. Or they, you know, all those kinds of things. When we start to um, put emphasis and amplify those differences, they become the megaphone of the gospel that we preach. We start to preach our differences more than we preach the one who unites us in Christ Jesus. So, yeah remembering where the roots are. I love it. Um, it is 3.31 on my computer. Um, so I'm going to ask Megan, is this, do we end at 3.30? <laughs> yes, yes, we do. Um, I wanted to uh, thank everyone who has joined us today, um, particularly um, Evangeline, who has who been on our video. 
um, but hasn't necessarily been speaking. Evangeline was our gracious organizer who was able to help all of our panelists make it here at the same time. And um, thank you for that and for all the work that you do at the team program. Um, and thank you to PLTS. We should probably thank them too, right? We should. Um, yeah, <laughs> thanks PLTS for, for hosting this innovative program that has led to so many um, leaders that I know as I was watching and a lot of people on Facebook has commented how inspired they are by your voices. And so uh, that is a wonderfully beautiful thing. Next week um, on the 14th, we're gonna listen to um, folk from other traditions outside of the Lutheran church, some of the ways that they have seen success in decreasing bias. On the 21st, we have a panel of bishops, so that should be interesting um, to see some of the ways they either have a vision for decreasing bias in the future or ways that they've noticed it happening now, and hopefully we can all learn some things that we can share with each other. Uh, but before we sign off for the day, um, uh, we would love to to close in prayer. You ready to you ready to lead our prayer? Oh, almost. The Holy Spirit yes. wants you to unmute. There we go. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the Lord be with you, and also with you. Gracious Lord, we come before you right now. We thank you for this opportunity you have given us to share our thoughts and our experiences. We thank you for yet another day. We thank you for all these pastors, imagine pastors who have also been on this line. Father, we ask that whatever we discussed here, that it may be a blessing to those who are listening, those who are watching, and they may take this and it may be something positive for them as they move on in their different ministries and with whatever they are doing with those ministries. We thank you for your blessings, for your guidance and protection. We ask that you continue to be with us and all the panelists that are here. Father, we give you the glory and honor. This we pray through your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, May.